Okay, I guess we can get things started. So I just welcome you. Uh, there are going to be two weeks of events. First week here, and this week over Mount Royal at the University of Moyen for the workshop. Uh, this week, of course, you know, we have four mini courses given by Adam Clay, Tyrone Gaswala, uh, Andres Navas, and Thomas Coberta. And uh, that's about all I have to say. Other than I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Alexander Hadrish, there's Christina Redmond there, uh, there's the support staff, and Adelaide Quintero doing the coffee break. So uh, probably most of the questions you'll have will be directed to them because <laughs> they know what's going on. Um, and okay, so I'll just let Alexandra has, has some technical. Okay, so good morning and uh, welcome to Montreal for everybody who's come from outside of Montreal. I do want to thank uh, Steve Boyer and uh, Adam Clay who have really uh, done most of this. This was a very light organization for me. And thank you to Danny Wise for the bagels, <laughs> which is, which is a, a huge thank you, I would say. Um, so I just wanted to address a few uh, technical things, like if you want Wi-Fi for any of you who already are on the EDU Rome system in your universities, you can just log on through EDU Rome. That's what UCAM uses. If they don't, if you don't have that, we are trying for the first time a system uh, which they say should work, which is that you would text that number on the board and you would, the word that you would text would be orderable and somehow you should receive the information to access. As I say, you are our guinea pigs. If this does not work, I have left my email address there and you can email me and I can set up a personal account for you, which you could then use to access the Wi-Fi system, which in my experience has worked. So that, that would be fine, that doesn't work. Uh, one more thing, so we're going to be having sort of breakfast like this every day with bagels. Uh, so you can arrive, you know, around 8.30, 9, there'll they'll be breakfast. But our coffee breaks are being held in uh, the room 675. Uh, you'll see when you go out that we put arrows to lead you. It's a little bit of a breeze to get there, but if you can follow the arrows, you should find it okay. Um, and one last thing I was going to ask you about the coffee breaks, as you see, we're using real cups. If you could just hold on in some way to your try to hold on to your cup for the day, the end of the day, you'll see in the other room, there's a sort of little kitchenette, just leave it there. And this way we won't have to worry about, uh, you know, looking for your cups and we won't have to use, uh, cups that you throw away so it can be our little effort to plan it. <laughs> so thank you all. And if you have any other questions, you can email me or uh, you can come find my office. I'll just write my office number here. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Do we have paper? And there's some paper right up here. Yeah. We register your yeah, name and badge. Uh, Antonio, uh, but if you didn't register your name. Of course I did. Yeah. <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> yeah. But there you go. Yeah. So, but we'll let you have paper. If anybody needs more paper, I do have more in my office. I can bring that out. So just let me know uh, or email me any random questions. For lunch, uh, I think that uh, you can explore the, the neighborhood. If you just head sort of south towards uh, Place des Arts, you'll have multiple choices or even down on the first floor here, there are many choices, but there's some great restaurants just in the end. Thank you. Have a great, great um, mini course session. <laughs> Thanks, Alexander. Okay, yeah, so uh, we'll start off with Adam. Uh, yeah, okay. Of course, he's going to talk about, give an introduction to order structures on Zoom. Thanks, Steve. Uh, well, thanks for everyone for coming out. So I look out and I see uh, some familiar faces and lots of new faces. So I got to say, this is targeted at the new faces. Everybody who uh, knows me means you've probably thought about orderable groups for some time. So I'm really going to start at the beginning. I'm really going to try and welcome everyone on board. So this is going. To, this first lecture is going to be all about defining orderable and biodurable groups and showing how we might build them using some of the basic theorems available to us. Uh, so um, let's dive right in. So the first thing I have to begin with then is I can go all the way to the yeah, edge of this yeah, one. Yeah. 
you can write and even up in the yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I won't okay so um, beginning at the beginning so a left orderable group I'll begin by saying what a left ordering is a left ordering group B is a strict total ordering which I'll always denote by less than uh, of G such that uh, G less than H implies FG is less than FH for all F, G, H, and G. And when G admits such an ordering, I'm going to call it LO. So if G admits such, call it LO. By ordering is when you can multiply also from the other side. So uh, the group is BO by orderable if uh, it admits uh, left order that satisfies right invariance. So B less than H implies GF less than HF for all F. G, H, and G. So no surprises. Uh, the second perspective that we want to use from time to time to think about these things is just in terms of positive elements. So another way of thinking about this is, uh, so alternatively, uh, we can just specify the collection of positive elements of an ordering and that determines the ordering. So here's what I mean. Um, a group G is LO if there exists a subset P in G such that, and start up here, it's a semi group and it partitions the group. So this is disjoint union, we'll write it square. And the way to see that these are equivalent is. Well, obviously, if you have an ordering, I was saying we're specifying the positive elements. So they're equivalent because if I start with this, I map it to the set of guys that are bigger than the identity. And if I start with P, I map it to G is less than H, if and only if G inverse H is in P. So you can check that this is a bijection. And uh, that means that if we want, we can talk about particular subsets of G, or we can talk about orders on G, and it means essentially the same thing. Um, I will say, when we're restricting our attention to left orderable groups, a natural question might be, why aren't you talking about right orderable groups? And it's because they're the same thing, because every left ordering becomes a right ordering if we take inverses. The left invariance becomes right invariance. So um, now examples. Uh, with only the definition in hand, it's hard to actually come up with decent examples. So we'll have to do a few propositions or lemmas. But uh, so I'll just say the first obvious examples are you know the things that we all know, like Z, U, R. But uh, already there are some funny things that happen. So for instance, this has two left orders. This has two left orders. That has uncountably many because you can think of it as an infinite dimensional vector space over Q and do some lexicographic stuff. Um, so that always surprised me when I first learned these. Um, another example uh, would be, what about instead of Z, we do Z squared. So in order Z squared, like this. And the thing that I'm gonna write will generalize to Z to the N, but I'll just write it for Z squared so that it's easy. Um, so we could choose something like this in R2 with, let's say, a rational slope. And then declare, um, I only need to specify the positive elements. So what I'll do is I'll declare M n bigger than 0, 0, uh, if and only if. So the dot product of this and this is positive. And you can think about that as being, we're taking a line of a rational slope in the plane, and here's our vector that I'm talking about. And what we're doing 
is we're declaring one side of this line to be positive and the other side to be negative. And because we've chosen a line of irrational slope, we don't have to worry about some points not being dealt with by that prescription because there's nothing on that line if we're thinking about the integer lattice points. So that does order z squared. And then, of course, you can do the same thing for z to the n, but you got to be a little bit careful about you know, choosing a hyperplane that somehow doesn't intersect the integer lattice, and uh, you can still do it. If it does intersect the integers, for instance, if this was a rational slope line, then you just need to make two choices. You choose a positive side of the line, and you choose a positive direction on the line as well, and that can also work out. Um, another example, which I won't go into the details, but very important to know, but is um, three groups that are actually bioiterable. So, um, so consider F three on uh, X one, X two, and so on, countably many generators. And then I'll give a hint about how this can be done, but not go through all the steps. What I want to do is uh, consider this. So this is going to be uh, the ring of formal power series and non-commuting variables. OK. And then um, what I want to do is take this free group and embed it in here. And then you can actually, by hand, construct a bioordering on the group of units of this guy. So let me just say what the embedding is. You can define an embedding or an injective map. Uh, mu from f to here by, uh, well, you send little xi to one plus big xi. And then that means that this has to go to the formal inverse, right? So this is going to be one minus xi plus xi squared minus xi cubed and so on. Um, so the Injective part is, you know, you have to do some work there to see that that works out, but it does. So this works out to be injective. And what you can do is, without using any fancy theorems or anything, more or less straight from the definition, uh, you can build uh, from the definition. And what I mean by that is no, no theorems, you just state it and then check it, uh, a by ordering on um, subgroup of elements of the form one plus terms of order higher than one. This is what I mean by this. And this subgroup admitting a by ordering and the image of this map landing in there means that F is going to be by orderable as well. Sort of, uh, so the embedding mu uh, gives a by order of f. <laughs> and this is uh, sort of a famous construction. This is due to Magnus. So I should put it right here. The Magnus embedding. That's how that's sometimes known or usually known. The terms here are supposed to be minus plus minus plus. So it's not supposed to, the product isn't supposed to be one. So. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, it's not having a model. One minus plus minus plus. Oh, it does work out to be. Uh, this works out to be one, doesn't it? Side squared. Yeah, I think it all cancels correctly. Would have been a riot otherwise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, so there's one, <laughs> one minus. X. That's good. Yeah, Keep right. me on my toes, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it works out. That it, yeah, it is a homomorphism and it ends up being an embedding. So you can find yourself a copy of F inside of this thing that you can order. And um, I'll just say in words, uh, the way that you can order it is actually, all you have to do is you choose an ordering in each degree of the terms. So like the degree two terms, you just choose some prescribed ordering of those terms, maybe lexicographic or something like that. And then you write all the elements in here with, uh, in terms of increasing degree, and in each degree, they're ordered in a certain way. And um, then all you do is 
you compare two elements in the coefficient of the first term where they differ and you order them according to that coefficient because the coefficient is coming from the integers. So there will be a sense of which is bigger and which is smaller. And that happens to work out. Isn't, can't you just take P like positive, like words in the generators without inverses? Positive words in the generator. Oh, in F? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the same, like, like I you can take it as a semi group, but then own, it, it yeah. doesn't do this then. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that a way of describing an easy? Uh, it turns out that left orders are very hard to describe explicitly in general. Like yeah, if, no, no, I mean for the free group. For the free group? Yes. Okay. But uh, there is, yes. So that's a good question. There is an order, which is not a by order which I know of that you can actually describe very easily, but I've saved that for lecture two because I'm actually going to do it for uh, arbitrary free products. Yeah. Um, okay. So, all right. Yeah. Um, is there a uh, positive uh, own interpretation for by orderability as well? Uh, yes. Thank you. I skipped over that step in my notes. So the positive cone of a by order has to be invariant under conjugation. So let me write that down explicitly what I mean. So if we think of by orders as positive cones, um, P is the positive cone by order. If in addition to one and two, it satisfies three, the conjugation of positive elements preserves their positivity. Thanks. So um, another tool for creating left orders is uh, showed exact sequences. So uh, let me write this down and then we'll talk about how you can use it. So, so suppose uh, you have a positive cone PK and K, PH and H, these are positive cones. Uh, I guess I should specify of left orders not by orders, I have to be a little careful here. Um, and that you've got a short exact sequence. This, let me name these maps, I, U. Uh, so then I of PK, meaning U inverse PH, that's a positive cone on G uh, of a left order. And um, you might be wondering, okay, but what if I describe this in terms of orders? Less than K, less than H, it's gonna give less than E somehow? Like what's going on here? Uh, so it's easiest to write down the description in terms of positive cones, I find, but then it, it actually makes most sense if I just say what you're doing. It's the lexicographic order. So what you do is you take two elements in G and you look at their image. And if their images are different, you order them according to their images. If their images are the same, then you have to look at the product, like say it's G and H, you look at the product G inverse H and K and order, it, order them according to the sign of that. So this is the positive cone of the order I've just described. Um, it unfortunately doesn't work this way for by orders. So they don't behave well with respect to short exact sequences. So, Arc by orders, this doesn't work. And a good example would be if you take this group, I mean, that fits into a short exact sequence like this. Uh, let's call this our G. Um, so you've clearly got a by order here and a by order here, but when I put them together in the middle, this is not by orderable because this element, its sign is not preserved by conjugation because X is changing it to its inverse, right? Is it um, by some other way? No, this is just this is just not by order. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um this doesn't work. Yeah, G is not by order. But what's happening here, where the positive cone of the kernel is not preserved by conjugation, that's exactly the obstruction to it working. Right. So here, the fact that X conjugates Y to be something which is not in the positive cone is exactly the problem. Um, so we need uh, G I of PK 
the inverse is contained in I P K all G. Then it works. Well, it's enough that I write it that way. So then the proposition works. So now, um, you know, we're in a position to start ordering some more interesting groups. Uh, for instance, you know, metabelian groups where the kernel is torsion free and the quotient is torsion free. For instance, we could do a lot of those. Um, but rather, oh, I guess. Rather than uh, sort of see how far we can push with the tools that we have, um, let me just go ahead and give an equivalent formulation of what it means to be left orderable. A couple, actually. And then we'll see that we can actually create many, many left orderable groups with what I'm about to do. So I'll call, I'll call this a theorem, because I guess it's the first thing that deserves a title. So. Here's an equivalent formulation of what it means to be left orderable. So a group G is LO if and only if um, it, the group, admits an effective action by order preserving bijections on a totally ordered set. And then we're going to strengthen this a little bit to get something even sort of more interesting when G is countable, but we'll do this case first. Um, so let me tell you how the proof goes, because one direction is easy and the other direction is, uh, let's say, it's a little bit, a little bit uh, unexpected. What's an effective action? Ah, okay. So I'll just replace proof with recall. It means that um p dot x equals x for all x and x but only when g is the identity and it, we'll see exactly where that gets used when i do this proof of it. it's going to be very uh, explicit so so um one direction i will say is obvious if g is an lo group then it emits an effective action by order preserving projections because it just acts on itself by left multiplication right and that preserves the order because that's what we're talking about. So uh, I'll say this direction, check, it's clear. So the other direction, I want to start with uh, G acts effectively by order preserving projections on this set. Now, what I want to do is. Um, I mean, step one is something that's a little bit uncomfortable for me, but step one is I want to invoke the existence of a well order on this set, a well order completely unrelated to this order, just anyone. Um, so choose a well order <clears throat> on X, call it, I'll say, uh, early less than. And um, now what I want to do is I want to use the well order. You know, because now relative to this order, every non-empty subset has the smallest element, right? That's the whole point of this. And so now what that tells me is that um, I can make this definition. So for every G that's not the identity, set X sub G to be the smallest element relative to this curly order um, in X that's moved by G. And it's exactly the action being effective that tells us this set is non-empty. So it has the smallest element, right? So that's why this XG exists. Um, now what I want to tell you to do is just, uh, if you're wondering what the sign of G should be in the left order that we need to show exists, uh, just check what it does to this XG. So now, um, Declare G and G uh, positive, i.e., we're building that set P. So G is in the positive form P, if and only if uh, G acting on XG is bigger than XG. Um, now, I'll say the rest is just checking now that I've told you this is how it works. Right? So, what you need to do now is you need to check that. 
I take the product of two positive elements with this definition of positivity, then their product is again positive. And you have to check that this partitions the group. Although partitioning the group is not so hard because we assume the action is effective. So every element has a corresponding guy like this, which is either moved up or moved down. So that's how you do it. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Silly question, but why do you need to choose this swell or drain? Can't you just take the axiom of choice? Yeah, okay. There are other there are other ways of disguising the axiom of choice here, but you have to use it one way or another. And uh, for me, I so I'm invoking a well ordering here because in my mind, this is almost like a, a variation of being a lexicographic order, you know, where you're looking sort of in the XG position, what is this doing, right? And um, so for me, this is how I'm thinking of it, and this is why I choose a well order. I think there's probably also, I have seen actually a Zorn's Lemma approach to doing this same thing, but somewhere it's gonna have to come up that you use the axiom of choice. But the, but the point is you don't need any coherence that would come from this being a or well ordering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cho choose like a random element for each. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. yeah, this is actually what that was at. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah, that's exactly it, yeah. Um, so what I want to say now is uh, we can improve this more than slightly, quite a lot actually, if G is countable. So let me show you the stronger thing we can say when G is because, um, you know, sure, this is an equivalence, but uh, maybe it's not so obvious where we get, um, you know, order preserving actions by bijections in everyday life. Well, I'll show you for countable groups, it's you know, quite often. So, so let's just say um, another theorem. So suppose, uh, G is countable. G is left orderable if and only if there exists an embedding a homeo plus R. Right? So the additional thing that we can get from countability is that this actually acts by homeomorphisms, not just by order preserving bijections. Um, so what I'm going to do is give a construction that shows how this can be done. But I'll sort of make a few remarks about how you can generalize it and sort of make a cleaner definition at the end. So uh, let's just say here's how it should go. So, on the one hand, if we have such an embedding and we want to show that it's left orderable, that's already done by this because this group itself is left orderable by the previous marks. So, we don't have to do the, this direction. Done. The direction that we have to deal with is if G is countable and left orderable, then how do we build this action? So let me say one construction that works. So it's countable, so let's enumerate G. And we'll start with the identity and uh, let's, call, uh, let's call that G0. And then we have G1, G2, and so on. Uh, now, what I want to do is I want to inductively define an embedding of this ordered set into that ordered set. And because it's countable, it's going to work. So here's how I do it. So I send the identity to zero. And now I have to tell you what to do if we've already embedded the first K. What do I do with K plus one? So if T of identity T of G1, T of K, I've defined. And uh, I'll write the formula up here. T of G, A plus one is going to go uh, one of three places. So it's either going to go to max of the previously defined guys. Um, plus one, if uh, GK plus one is bigger than all of them in the left order, right? And then it's going to go to min minus one if it's less than all those guys. 
if it lies in between two that have previously been embedded, just put it exactly in the middle, right? So it's going to go to B e of G, J, B e of G, I, two, if G, J less than G, K plus one less than G, I, and no other element is already in there. So, and no G, L is between uh, G, J and G, I, where uh, L is between zero and Okay. Should I interpret the plus one as like translate by a unit? Yeah, yeah. This is all happening inside of R, right? So these are real numbers, and then we're just going plus one bigger than all those. Yeah. Yeah. And so now um, I want to give a very hand wavy explanation of how to change this into an embedding. Because if we sort of got. I don't, I don't see where G. If the left one is GJ, if the right one is GI, or the opposite. Oh, which it's GJ and GI, but it doesn't matter because they're just something going to take in the average. So they just choose the midpoint. Um, yeah, so now my instruction on how to, because all we did now is we embedded the group as an ordered set with total disregard for the fact that it's a group and has an actual group structure. So now let's take that into account. So, um, so we have. Now what I want to do is say, well, uh, you can define the action like this on um, on the image of T, right? Because some points in R are of the form T of H for some H and G. And this is what we want. Rho of G. Say this is my rho. Define this um, in this way. But then, you know, what do you do for points that are in... Uh, you know, complement of the image of T. So define this and then extend to T of G closure. I'll say by continuity. So what I mean is for a point in this closure, you want to choose a sequence of points in the image converging to the point in the closure and then insist upon a definition which makes this map continuous, right? So extend to this by continuity. And now um, there could be some points left over. So it happens that this might be empty, but maybe there's some stuff left over. If there's stuff left over, this is a union of intervals and we want to extend affinely to that. So um, this gives a row from G to homium plus R. And now this last sentence here, is a pretty heavy claim because there's a lot, a lot, a lot of details to check, but it works out. Um, the essential thing is that the formula for the map that I gave here uh, sort of very carefully embeds the group in such a way that things do not go wrong. Uh, the essential thing that could go wrong is that anytime, so if you go away and work through these details, you'll find yourself coming upon the following point. Uh, anytime you have a non-empty, uh, this is non-empty, and you have sort of like a gap in the image of T, there has to be a corresponding gap in the order of the group, which is to say there's two group elements that in the order have nothing in between them. And so you have to have like these gaps correspond to those gaps. And if you don't, then something will go wrong. But as long as you've got that, then working out the details of this is going to be okay. Yeah. Uh in case G is bigger than countable, can you make a strategy like this work for things longer than R? Uh, so if G is, yeah, so if G is not countable, you can come up, I'm pretty sure, with some ordered set where relative to the order topology, you're embedding it in some sort of way that gives you a continuous action uh, relative to the order topology. But the thing is, there's never going to be some sort of universal thing that makes it always work because you can just ask for a group with even larger current set of cardinality and it sort of ends up breaking it. And countability here is uh, not necessary in order to get embeddings like this, but it is necessary for some formula like this to always work. Like you can certainly find groups that are bigger than countable that are embedded in there and their left orders are coming from uh, the action on R. Yeah. 
what, what if instead of well you, you map the group inside r first but what if we just used almost the same formula but mapping uh, the group elements to homeo plus because we know there is a left ordering on it right by this thing that you can mm -hmm. so like t of g whatever be uh, like you know the identity and then you build can, can you build it again by hand like this using the left ordering on homeo plus I don't understand. I guess I'm saying like map group elements to homeomorphisms. Oh, I see. Immediately, but like basically by this formula, would it not work? Oh, Where does it break? Um, we map identity to the identity, and then okay, I guess it won't be a group. Uh -huh. Yeah, a group theoretic embedding. Yeah, in order for it to be a homeomorphism, like after you've done all this and you check that you've got homeomorphisms, you still need to check it's a homomorphism of groups. So yeah, makes sense. So I'll just say this allows us to um, sort of shortcut our way to lots and lots of examples of left orderable groups. Anything that you can embed in homeo plus R now you've got many ways of left ordering it, right? Because um, you've got as many ways of left ordering it as, well, it's good. Okay, this is not quite true, but you can choose different well orderings on R, and every well ordering will conceivably give you a new left order of the group that you've embedded. It doesn't always work out that they're different, but it certainly gives you lots to play with and lots to look at. Um, so, and another way, I mean, I said that the free groups are uh, bi orderable, and I gave this embedding. If you wanted to say they're left orderable, you could just say something like, ah, oh, choose any two homeomorphisms generically, that's a free group, so it's left orderable. Right. And, yeah, that's true, but uh, maybe not as enlightening as uh, actually building the order. Uh, okay, so what I'd like to do now is uh, sort of give a give a couple theorems that are going to allow us to uh, distill the property of a group being left orderable down to something that's a condition on finite subsets of elements or finitely generated subgroups, and uh, I'm going to do it in a way that uh, I've never done before. So let's see if it works out. So, um, so my goal here is to give a condition that implies orderability that's something about finite subsets of a group and finitely generated subgroups sub of a group. So um, what I want to do is introduce a property that a uh, sub semi group of a group can have. So, uh, so a semi group P in G uh, can have property star have this property star um, for every finite set of elements P1, Gn, uh, in G, not the identity, there exists exponent plus or minus one uh, such that the identity of the group is not in the semi-group generated by uh, P with the identity thrown away. And these elements raised to the exponents that we have. Okay? I mean, not in. Oh, not in. Thank you. Um, so this is a property that a semi-group could have. And now let me say uh, what the use of this is. So uh, this property actually encodes exactly uh, when a semigroup extends to a positive cone, or in other words, when it's in contained in the positive cone of some left ordering. So, so given a semigroup U in G, um, there exists a positive cone. P in G with Q minus the identity contained in P, uh, if and only if Q satisfies star. Okay. So um, the way we're going to do this is some maximality argument using Zorn's lemma, right? Like that's hopefully what it feels like is supposed to happen. So let's go through and do it. Can you explain in conditions star? I'm sorry. Can you explain once again? I see, I'm, I'm trying to read it. It says identity is not in the semi-group generated by. So you're starting with- uh, Could you explain the P and then you took away the identity and 
Yeah, so you're starting with a semigroup, may contain the identity. And now I'm saying that P has property star if when you take P and you cut the identity out of it, and now you generate this like huge semigroup generated by all the elements of P together with a finite set to these particular exponents, then it doesn't contain the identity. So a way of thinking of it is you can always take P, cut out the identity, and generate this sub semigroup, right? But then the point is, anytime someone challenges you with a finite set of elements that might sort of mess up your creation of a positive cone, like you're trying to make something that is a positive cone at the end. Anytime somebody gives you a challenging set of elements, you can always find these exponents so that you can toss them in, generate the semigroup, and you haven't accidentally included the identity. And so for instance, if P minus the identity were contained in a positive cone, this is always possible because you just look at the signs you need to choose to make these positive, right? And then it's not going to contain the identity because the whole semigroup is happening inside the positive cone. Yeah. So that's actually the first thing I want to say right here is that one direction is that uh, so if uh, Q with the identity is contained in P for some positive cone, <laughs> Epsilon i's that exist uh, by choosing them so that uh, gi, the epsilon i, is in p. But now the other direction. And once this is done, we'll be able to sort of tick off a whole bunch of corollaries quite easily. So the other direction is so suppose q satisfies star. And then um, take a non-identity element in the group. And I want to observe that one of uh, these two semigroups, <laughs> with the identity cut out V or G inverse, one of these satisfies star. And to see that, let's just say, well, suppose not. Uh, well, if not, then um, there exists H1 up to Hn non identity elements in the group, and F1 up to Fm non identity elements in the group, such that uh, identity is in the semi group generated by this. Here's what it means for uh, this semigroup to fail to have property star h1 to the epsilon 1, hn to the epsilon n. So the identity is in there no matter how we choose the epsilons. No matter the epsilon i's. And the identity is in here. So F1, I will say new one, Fm, new M, no matter. Okay. So, but then the identity is going to be in this semigroup. So Q minus identity, whoops. And then I put a G here with an epsilon. And then I put all the H's. Epsilon n. And then I put all the f's. Right. The identity is going to end up being in there no matter my choice of epsilon, epsilon i's, new i's. So I'll say no matter our choices. And that's contradiction because this would exactly mean that q didn't have property star. Okay. So having made that observation, Here's how we set ourselves up to use Zorn's lemma. So what I want to do is I want to set M to be semigroups um, in G 
Sorry, if if G was countable, you would just like just one by one at this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's uh, sort of you have to fuss a little bit. If it was countable, you could just sort of go through the elements one at a time and say, oh, "Here's the sign I have to choose here. Here's the sign I have to choose here," and make an argument that way. Yeah. Um, U and P satisfying. So now I want to say um, it's not empty because it contains Q. It's totally ordered by inclusion. Oh, not empty. Or sorry, partially ordered by inclusion, partially ordered. And not going to do it, but you can check that uh, taking unions gives maximal elements for any chain as an upper whoops bound. And I'll just put it in brackets, take unions. So it implies there exists a maximal. And you know, P could have the identity. And so if we cut the identity of P minus the identity is a positive cone. So then P minus the identity is a positive cone. And P minus the identity is going to contain Q minus the identity as we were looking for. And I'll just leave it at this. To check that it's a positive cone, um, you just have to check that, uh, you know, condition star exactly forces that this is going to be a positive cone. Like just go through the definition and check that you've forced it to be such. So, okay. And that will follow because of this, what we checked in the left board. Like if you were Yeah, exactly. Anything, so like the fact that. that you can always add one more element if it doesn't cover the whole group means that the union of P and P inverse is going to give G minus the identity. And the fact that P intersect P inverse is, going to, well, P minus the identity intersect P minus the identity inverse. The fact that that's empty is exactly condition star. So uh, now we can start saying a few corollaries that are <clears throat> extremely useful. So first corollary uh, is LO. If and only if for all finite subsets of non-identity elements, uh, there exists Epsilon i equal plus or minus one, such if the identity is not in the semi group generated by these guys to the chosen powers. And that's exactly this with Q being the identity semi group. So, <clears throat> so check. That's one thing we can do. Um, next, if all the finitely generated subgroups are left orderable, so is the group. If uh, all finitely generated subgroups of G are LO, so is G. And it's again, uh, we can apply this, right? So you take a finitely generated subgroup, and then if that subgroup is left orderable, you choose the epsilon i so that the generators of the subgroup are all positive in the left ordering of the finitely generated subgroup. And then it's not going to contain the identity of the semigroup that they generate. So check to that one too. Um, so now the sort of crowning achievement of all this, though, I would say is the next thing. So next is um, this actually has names attached to it for its tail. And this is. Um, we can actually do better than just looking at finitely generated subgroups and whether or not they're left orderable. We can look at the quotients of finitely generated subgroups. And if every finitely generated subgroup has a left orderable quotient, non-trivial, I don't want your left orderable quotient to be the identity group or something like that. If every finitely generated subgroup has a non-trivial left orderable quotient, that's enough to left order the group. So um, let me say that. So, a group P is LO, if and only if for every finitely generated subgroup H V, there exists a surjection H L, L and non trivial LO group. A uh, fancy way of saying this that helps me remember it is. Uh, it's locally projectable onto the class of left orderable groups, then it's left orderable. So let me say how you would do this. But all I'm going to do is set myself up to do an induction and then say, and now it works. Okay. 
And the way that we do it is exactly that. So what we want to do is we want to show that given a finite set of elements, we can choose appropriate exponents by virtue of the fact that we have these maps. And what I want to do is induct on the size of the finite set. So let's start with one element. And now what I need to do is just say, well, obviously that's right. So uh, we're going to find uh, epsilon i's for any finite set G1, Gn of non-identity elements by induction. So let's say we have one element. Uh, it's a little bit silly, but if you have one element, then uh, <laughs> the finitely generated, you know, this group is uh, induction <laughs> onto a finitely generated left orderable group. I mean, the left orderable group has to have one generator has to be Z, right? So if this is a surjection, then that can't be finite order, right? So everything is fine. Just choose any exponent and it works. So any, so that's our, the beginning of our induction. I can set up the induction and then I'll stop. Is this, maybe I can do a little more than set it up. So let's just see. What we wanna do now is we wanna say, uh, suppose for all finite subsets, G1 up to uh, Gn, non identity elements, n plus or equal to k, there exists uh, appropriate exponents. That's what I'll say. Right, so that you can make choices so that the identity is not in the semi group generated by these. Um, so then uh, take a set of k elements. K plus one. Um, and now what I do is I choose a surjection. Let's just call it phi that goes from here onto L. And let's suppose that you know the first R of these go to the uh, go to the identity, and the last few have non-trivial image. Some of them have non-trivial image because it's a surjection. E of H one. E of H2, E of R, identity, and then HR plus one, HK plus one. These are all non identity elements. And the point is, there's at least some that are not the identity. So now what I do is this. This is left orderable, so put an order on it and look at these elements, choose their signs so that they're all positive. Choose epsilon r plus one, the epsilon k plus one, so that these, say j, epsilon j, whoops, epsilon j, so that these are positive, are all positive in a fixed left ordering of L, right? And then what do you do with these ones? Well, that's the induction hypothesis, right? They're uh, in the kernel. So use induction hypothesis, uh, epsilon one up to epsilon R. And then you check that works. So uh, the check that works, I'll leave that to you. And so is that, is that believable? Okay, so then uh, sort of pretty much out of time. So I'll make a couple of closing remarks. In particular, you could take L to just Z. Not always. Oh, yeah, that's actually something that I'm gonna say. Uh, so that's the case where L is always Z, that's local indicability. And I'm gonna talk about that at length in lecture three, because it ends up being a very special case that gives very special orders. Uh, let's see the first r were given by like some other l prime and so you did like you know the last r for r to k plus one using this l and then let's say the first r was given by some mapping on to yeah. prime is it just the lexicographic i mean like can we just think of it that uh the order you mean that's coming yeah. in the end yeah like so 
For the other group, we will just map the last bit to the identity and then the first bit to that, like however this map is working and then it's the lexicographic ordering. Well, in the end, no order comes from this, unfortunately. It's very much like an existence thing where there's not a prescribed order on the group that ends up coming from all of these maps. Um, the problem is that this orderability is not really behaving well under products or under... Uh, the problem is that they're not necessarily all compatible on all the different finally generated subgroups. Like if you put them together in this way, there's no sort of compatibility of all the things that you've built if you do it the way you're saying. Is free products of orderable groups orderable? Yeah, lecture two. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying, um, yeah, no, I understand. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's like there's a compatibility issue if you think about it, just being each of these is being used to build an order. They don't all match. And so it's like very much like some sort of existence thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to like yeah, map to create a third group so that like the whole thing. Oh, yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to do that. I don't know. If that's I'm a... mapping like the last bit, to, like, you know, if you had a group for the first bit, then you map the last bit to the identity there. And then the first bit goes to, but then I don't know how to put these two groups together. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the issue. Yeah, putting them all together. Yeah. Okay, so. I'll say what can be done in the end. So I'm, you know, a couple minutes over, but I'll I'll just say what happens from here. Okay. So you notice I talked about by orders at the start. And then for the last little bit with all this semi-group stuff, I just did left orders, right? And so maybe you're wondering, well, uh, can I do can I go back and repeat all that stuff with by orders? And the answer is yes. But you need to throw in sort of conjugation invariants of the semigroups. And so instead of talking about semigroups the whole way through, you talk about normal semigroups generated by certain sets of elements. And you go through and you repeat the whole thing and it works up until here. And it doesn't work. And so uh, there is no burns hale theorem for bi-orderable groups. And let me just say why. It's because, well, it's because it doesn't work. So let me give it a group that doesn't work. If you go back and you look at this thing, Right, but because of the fact that that fits into a short exact sequence like this, it's pretty easy to argue that any finitely generated subgroup of that has a surjection onto Z. In other words, a surjection onto a biorderable group. But despite the fact that every finitely generated subgroup has a surjection onto a biorderable group, this is definitely not biorderable itself. So go back, repeat all the arguments. It works for biorderability up to here, and then something goes wrong. You go back as far as like, is there an effective action theorem for yes? Groups? Okay. Except the additional property that the effective action has to have is that uh, it's I'll just say it. It's if it's if G acts on X in such a way that it's bigger than X, then uh, G is going to act on all Y in such a way that it's bigger than or equal to Y. So what I mean is, it's sort of like if you imagine it as being a. Uh, like, for instance, if you're thinking of it as acting on homeo plus R and you're thinking of like graphs of elements, because now it's just homeomorphisms of R, so we can graph them. It's sort of like saying if uh, one point is moved to be above the diagonal, then the graph of the whole function is above the diagonal or maybe touching the diagonal at some fixed points. And so you can go back and sort of repeat the biorderability arguments and it all works, but you find out that you need this extra property to get biorderability. So that's it. And it yeah. We're at the questions part, so keeps going. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned there's this sort of principle that proves the free group is orderable, where you take two random elements of homeo plus R. Didn't the same principle prove that like groups with very few relators are left orderable? Like, can you get that? Is it true that torsion-free one-relator groups are left orderable? Yeah. I think torsion-free one-relator groups. Uh, somebody will correct me if I say something wrong. I think they actually end up being stronger than left orderable. They're, what's, they're locally indicable. And then they're going to have this fancy kind of order called the Conradian order. Yeah. But I don't know about if you uh, try to sort of apply the same argument to something about. You just pick homeomorphism so that one relator works and then. Yeah, I'm not, I've never seen that. I've never seen the argument, like a proof of the fact that I just said, I've never seen it done from the perspective of homeomorphisms of R and P. I've always, the only proof I know is like very combinatorial in terms of like combinatorial group theory and like small cancellation or something. Uh, anything else? All right. Okay, well, maybe it's time for me to say there's going to be a half hour coffee break in room 5675. There are pointing to it. There'll be plenty of opportunities there to ask further questions.
Uh, we'll turn again half an hour to Tyrone uh, Gaspar will begin to talk about uh, circular order. Thanks.